Good afternoon, everyone. I'm uh, joined uh, today by uh, Louis Vachon, the Chief Executive Officer of uh, National Bank of Canada. Thank you for uh, joining us. Yeah, thank you for the invitation. Um, I'll jump right into it. You know, National Bank's uh, biggest business is personal and commercial banking. Um, it's something that you share with all the other Canadian lenders. Uh, however, you do have a, a strong focus in Quebec. Um, I'm, I'm wondering what you're seeing in terms of uh, consumer credit conditions, uh, debt levels, and uh, mortgages uh, at your bank in, in Quebec. Uh, conditions remain very, very good. Um, first of all, the employment, uh, it's, uh, we're, for the first time in documented history, Quebec has the lowest unemployment rate of any provinces in Canada. Um, in terms of labor participation rate, we're, we're sitting, uh, you know, also very high percentages. We have the second highest uh, employment level by women uh, in the workforce uh, after Sweden. So people are working. And when people are working, um, they're, uh, they're spending and they're also saving quite a bit. The saving rate is quite high. The other thing that's, uh, so people are working and housing affordability is, uh, is still uh, remains very good in Quebec. So uh, people have access to property and they don't have to, uh, you know, borrow a uh, huge amount of money to get access to property. So you, you, so you end up with basically, you know, high savings rate and lower um, debt, uh, debt to uh, income ratios in terms of, uh, of, uh, of debt for consumers. But are you seeing any danger signs looming and is Quebec, uh, mm -hmm. do you see it as a little bit different than the rest of Canada? No, uh, no, danger signs, no, not in the, uh, in the real estate. It's still, it's, you know, it's mid to high single digit uh, increases in valuations mm -hmm. in some markets in Montreal. It's not the whole thing, and it's very concentrated in five or six neighborhoods where you see more um, international investors in. But the rest of the market, it's still, uh, I think it's still very much under control. Okay. And uh, throughout the day, we've been asking uh, uh, our panelists and guests about uh, their expectations of uh, a Canadian recession in the next 12 months. What, what are your thoughts? Uh, well, my very good uh, chief economist was here and gave a, a number at 30%. <coughs> so why am I to uh, argue with that number? Uh, <laughs> the, the question, I think the, the issue is, I think the 30%, uh, whatever the probability is, I don't think if there is a recession in Canada in, two, in 2020, it's not going to be made in Canada. It's mm -hmm. clearly going to be caused by geoeconomic factors coming from outside of Canada. I think that's the key thing. Well, let's drill a little, uh, one of your biggest areas of, of the business is, is mortgages. Let's take a little bit of a closer look at that. We've seen growth in uninsured mortgages uh, rise while insured mortgages have uh, declined in the, in the past couple of years. It's a trend that we've seen actually with all the Canadian banks. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering, um, how is that affecting your credit profile at the bank? Uh, we're not concerned about that right now. I think we're quite comfortable. I think we, in terms of credit, consumer credit, we've been clear on two points. One, we're overweight Quebec, and we want to remain overweight Quebec. Uh, doesn't mean we're not growing outside of Quebec. We just want to make sure that our growth outside of Quebec is at the same speed as the, what we're generating in Quebec, which is pretty, pretty easy to do right now. The second one, we have a strong preference, and we've said that for many years, for secured receivables versus unsecured ones. What it means is, you know, we like uh, HELOCs, we like uh, mortgages, and we were much less aggressive in terms of uh, credit card receivables. So that's how we're positioned, and we feel that uh, uh, that's the right positioning for the few years to come. Okay, and business loan growth has also been outpacing retail lending among, again, all the Canadian banks and, and yourselves. Um, yet we're facing all these geopolitical concerns, uh, whether we're talking about uncertainties on Brexit or trade wars, um, and that potentially could threaten uh, uh, companies in, in the economy. Mm -hmm. uh, is the accelerating uh, pace of commercial loan growth a uh, cause for concern for you? No. Um, and I'll tell you why. I think you, there's a couple phenomena that explains um, why we're having um, commercial loan growth ahead of, of nominal GDP growth. Mm -hmm. One of them is um, uh, the fact that we've had now uh, through both the uh, at the provincial level in Quebec and at the federal level, we've seen accelerated uh, depreciation mechanisms. So we see finally, you know, greater numbers in terms of business investments and in equipment that we've had, and that, that helped a little bit loan growth. The second thing, which is a cyclical trend, uh, in, which is true in Canada, and I suspect it's true also in the US, 
we've had most businesses in Canada are owned by baby boomers. And they're getting to their peak years. Mm -hmm. And uh, they are now in a situation where they have to pass the baton to the next generation. So this, this business ownership transfer is fueling a lot of, uh, of uh, financial transactions. Uh, most balance sheets of commercial businesses in Canada, small and medium-sized businesses, are very healthy. So that means that usually the new buyer, the new acquirer, will leverage up the balance sheet a little bit to, um, to acquire the company. And that phenomenon, which we've seen, that fueled M&A activities mm -hmm. in investment banking, and I'll say all of you are familiar with this, it's also fueling increased activity in commercial banking. So that's, that's not number two. Number three is a healthy level of development in commercial real estate. And when you're looking at demographic growth in Canada, which is quite high, particularly in the three, three cities of Montreal, Toronto, and uh, Vancouver, um, there's a lot of activity in commercial real estate. And that's the third element that's fueling commercial uh, loan growth. Uh, you have one very interesting business within your bank. I mean, you have several, but um, yeah. the, the one I want to flag is your debt buying business, uh, yeah. uh, Credigy. Um, you've had that for a number of years now. It's one of your fastest growing businesses. Um, but however, you said back in August that um, you guys are now going to be focusing on disciplined growth um, as you replace assets coming to maturity. Uh, I'm wondering, are you, are you still buying debt um, with that business? And what are you looking at for trying to achieve your... I think you said your expectations were double-digit growth in 2020. Yes, uh, we still are. In fact, uh, the reason we're confident about uh, giving guidance to, uh, to that business for 2020 in terms of double-digit growth in earnings is the fact that we've acquired the portfolios already. Mm -hmm. So if we just look at the impact of the portfolios that we've purchased over the last few quarters, um, we have more than replaced the, uh, the assets that we're maturing in uh, 2019. So that's why we have good visibility. Um, it is a, you know, um, Credit G has been part of the national bank family now for 13 years. Uh, they're now, you know, full-fledged partners of the bank. And uh, it's a great team, uh, very strong at managing data, uh, at structuring deals. Um, and the flexibility we have in terms of asset class, the type of deals uh, make us quite confident that we can continue to grow earnings on that business, you know, at a steady pace for, for many years to come. And as a reminder for people that may not be familiar with Credit G, what, what kind of debt? Uh, they purchase they only consumer debt. So they do not buy commercial debt. So it's the laws of, of big numbers. They want to buy credit card receivables, auto loans, uh, mortgages, and they purchase uh, both uh, performing loans and non-performing loans. And uh, so that capacity to go to different asset classes, also different geographies, They've made purchases you know, in, in the past in South America, uh, in the Caribbean, in the US, in Europe. So they have diversification in terms of asset classes, performing, non-performing, and geography. And um, on that basis, that's why they've been able to, uh, to be very good allocators of capital. Now that business share is the same division as uh, some of your international forays, your foreign forays. Um, some may argue that our potentially in risky areas of uh, uh, geography, and it's far from uh, you know, your Montreal headquarters. Uh, we're talking about uh, your investments in Africa, um, your investments in Asia, in Cambodia specifically. Um, you've uh, been going, uh, you've, you've started investing about five years ago. Uh, I think it was initially 200 million. It's now, I think, 625 was mm -hmm. about the total. Yeah. Uh, what have you learned from investing in these far-flung destinations? Uh, that it can be very profitable, <laughs> that's the first one. <laughs> uh, now, I think looking back, what we did right, I think uh, the diversified approach of, uh, of investing in, in three different locations and three different franchises, um, I think was the right one. I think we got to know different regions, different uh, markets, and more importantly, different management teams. Um, we saw quite early that we've, you know, we had a big winner with uh, ABA Bank in Cambodia. Mm -hmm. That's why we moved uh, very quickly to a 40% stake and then a 90%. Now we own, we own 100%. So uh, that's why I think in terms of our international division, the two key strategic assets are Credit G and ABA going forward. But and less so Africa, correct? Africa, yes. I think Africa, we've decided that we will, you know, over time dispose of those assets um, and really focus on this. I mean, we're achieving very high level of growth with both uh, Credigy and ABA, and we want to focus on good execution 
on those assets. And that's the main focus. Uh, we've had changes in Canada affecting the type of senior bonds that uh, banks can issue, a shift um, to bail-in notes yep. from uh, deposit notes. Uh, when it comes to the uh, long-term uh, market funding, should Canada's regulator allow systemic banks to keep selling deposit notes uh, in addition to uh, new senior bail-in? Uh, great question. I think well, that uh, if that this, this question is, is raised again, I think we should probably, as an industry, and more specifically a national bank, reach our TLAC level. Uh, and once that's reached, uh, and we see how easily that was done and, and so forth, and what the impact is uh, on our funding, maybe discuss with our regulator if there are any updates or changes or uh, things that should be made to the, to the law, to the, to the current requirements. And, um, but until we get to TLAC, I think that's just focused on what we need to do, and, uh, and that's what we're doing. Very good. Uh, you were in New York last month, actually, uh, to sign the Principles for Responsible Banking. So you're one of uh, only three banks in North America to have done so, and you know since then you've issued a three-year, seven hundred and fifty million dollar uh, sustainable uh, bond, mm -hmm. um, and that's obviously targeting uh, ESG investors. Yes. Um, what's your appetite for doing more of these, and um, is there any advantage to doing this type of offering other than sort of uh, subscribing to the values of the bank? Um, I think the ESG sector is uh, is a growing uh, uh, growing trend within financial markets. It will continue to be. Mm -hmm. um, I think that we see that that, that trend, uh, uh, if anything, accelerating. Um, so yes, I think we'll continue to address that. I think, as you know, we need to have uh, the assets on. You know, raising fund is one thing, and deposits and bonds, but we have to have the. Uh, uh, the assets on the other side that, that match that, that definition of sustainable, and that's what we're working on. So there's still room to grow, and I think uh, um, that's a market we're going to continue to access over the next few years, certainly. Uh, Canadian corporate bond issuance is uh, trailing uh, last year, about 5% when I looked at it this morning. Yeah. Uh, it's mainly due to lower issuance from the, uh, from the Canadian banks. Um, why is that, and do, do you see the trend continuing, um, or will the banks start to step it up? in terms of issuance? Uh, I don't think there's uh, any grand strategy there. I think uh, we all have to meet our, our TLAC uh, levels, and I think we're, you know, our treasury teams, like the ones of other <laughs> banks, are being opportunistic and looked around where, you know, they can raise the funds and, uh, and uh, do different deals. So um, I don't think there's, uh, you know, you can read anything in terms of long-term trends in there that's negative on Canada. I think we're just being opportunistic and, uh, and as you know, one or two months can change that trend very, very quickly. Yes. Uh, if, if, we, uh, if anything we've seen is uh, the level of issuance have been very concentrated in terms of, of calendar um, and getting so more and more. So no, there's no long-term trend that I see there that's, uh, that's negative for the Canadian f financial markets. Uh, corporate borrowers will usually cite the deepness of the, uh, of the US um, dollar and the euro yeah. for issuing in uh, international debt markets. Yeah. Um, is that an issue that weighs on debt sales in, uh, in the Canadian bond market? Well, you know, we're, we're comparing ourselves to the most efficient capital markets in the world. So, yeah, okay, we, Canada is not quite the same level as the U.S. That being said, if I look and, you know, I have a few years of experience now, how the Canadian financial market has evolved, uh, particularly on the fixed income side in terms of being able to uh, absorb and, and trade and sell different types of securities. And I will point, for instance, to... Yeah, lower grade uh, corporate bonds, even high yield bonds, which 10 or 20 years ago would have been very difficult to issue in Canada. And now we can do much larger issues. So yes, we're comparing ourselves to a very, uh, the, the deepest capital pool in the world. Mm -hmm. But that in of itself, I think the Canadian financial markets are getting, you know, uh, able to uh, absorb more and more different deals and, uh, and more and more corporate debt. So uh, Louis, you're the longest serving uh, among the current crop of Canadian bank CEOs. You, yeah, you but not the oldest. I no, you're not the that, uh, You know, I was careful on that. I didn't say the oldest. I said the longest serving. I'm not that age sensitive, <laughs> but I just want to precise that. You know. um, but, you know, you, you, uh, you've, you've been, um, you've, you've weathered the financial crisis. Um, yeah. uh, you've been in there. I actually took a look at your uh, stock's uh, performance since you've taken over, and You've, you've doubled your uh, shares, and uh, you're the, the best performing uh, uh, Canadian bank during that whole period. Um, having said all that, when, when, what's, what's left for you to do, and when is it time to retire? Very good question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Uh, listen, I, I think we, we have to work on succession, uh, and succession is not something you work on uh, six months before uh, you make the announcement. It's something that goes back to, you know, to the fundamentals of how you preserve your culture and evolve your culture, and how do you manage talent within an organization. So are we working on my succession, and uh, you know, who's going to be in terms of having talent that can replace me and replace the other members of senior management at the bank? Absolutely, of course we are. That's, that's one of the, the main responsibilities we have. But in the meantime, I don't have, uh, you know, I don't have any announcement to make today. Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, but, uh, Not that I'm trying to push you out. No, 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 thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I, I, th I think that's what we're working on. And you know, one day, uh, we'll have to move on. I'm not the founder of National Bank. I'm not the owner of National Bank. At some point as a CEO, things can, you know, you can do a good job. But at some point, you know, when you have to, to move on, you have to move on. And you have to put your franchise ahead of, uh, of your own personal agenda. That's the key thing. And, and if we look back, it's 12 years in the, in the, in the seat. And I mean, what have you, and I know maybe it's too early to talk about your legacy, but w looking over that 12 year period, you know, what have you seen or, or what are you particularly proud of or, or, or what can you point to that? Beyond the share price, of course. Yeah, I, I think the fact that we continue to evolve as an organization, you know, we um, and the evolution of the culture of the organization, and how's that reflected? It's reflected in, you know, an international strategy that wasn't there 12 years ago, an international strategy that's quite different than our peers, um, a wealth management strategy that's also very different than our peers, uh, that supports open architecture. Um, uh, and, and very focused on, on uh, not just on transactions, but on more on advice. Um, it's reflected in the fact that we've always believed in Quebec, um, always been proud to be a Quebec bank, uh, and also the fact that we were comfortable with the capital markets business, whereas a lot of people were not comfortable with wholesale. And uh, so we've, you know, we've had a path that's quite different than our peers, and uh, we stuck to that path. And we feel we have the culture and, you know, and the talent to continue to move it forward. So that's why I think in, in a few words is uh, what we think we've, we've done the last 12 years. And I certainly did it all by, my, you know, it's not by myself. We did it as a team. And uh, the day I retire, there's still going to be a very strong team to continue to, uh, to take that, that path that's quite different. And in, for, uh, in terms of what's left to do and that, we have seen a lot of Canadian banks uh, doing a little tuck on acquisitions and things like that throughout the world, you know, in the United States primarily with some of the other, your, your bigger rivals in that. Uh, you've obviously had your uh, international uh, acquisitions and now I guess we're talking divestitures in uh, Africa, but is there anything else out there that you'd be considering looking at or wanting to do? I, I think there's, you know, the, the, the one area, aside of, from international and on the international front, we've been very, you know, we've said quite clearly that our main, we're not looking to do more acquisitions internationally. We really want to focus on the quality of our execution uh, at Credit G and ABA Bank in Cambodia. Domestically, um, essentially all of our acquisitions in the last 12 years in Canada have been on the wealth management space. And um, so that added, you know, to, uh, we've added to National Bank Financial in terms of the full service advisory, a business we continue to believe in. Mm -hmm. And we made also the acquisition of uh, TD Waterhouse Institutional Services combined with Correspondent Network, and today we have by far the dominating business in providing uh, back office services to, uh, uh, to independent wealth managers. Um, so any, you know, on the wealth management space, we continue to be interested, but they have to make sense from a financial standpoint and a cultural standpoint, both. Um, so you do a screen, the way we look at the screen, it's a very few, you know, there are very few, few dots that show up on that screen. Um, for the rest, we'll focus on, on you know, organic growth. But that's f by far. And, and frankly, I've made acquisitions in the past, mm -hmm. um, the last 12 years. I don't like acquisition. You know, uh, it's, I feel they're, they're risky. Uh, they, 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 they really take a lot of time and attention, sometimes out of proportion to the financial impact they can possibly, potentially have. So um, I think management of my, uh, the, our team knows that when they bring an acquisition thing to me, it has to be a pretty damn good thing. Because, uh, you know, my first thing I say is, no, don't bother me. And that's the polite version of it. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I tend to be very skeptical in acquisitions. And, you know, I want my team to focus on organic growth um, and capital management.
last question in the in the in the dying seconds uh, that we have here. Um, what uh, and going back to you know your positiveness about the Quebec economy and that, but what keeps you awake at night? Uh, so <laughs> there was a one of my competitors was asked that question on a panel uh, a couple months ago and said, "I work so hard uh, that nothing keeps me up at night." <laughs> <laughs> He's lost his job since then. Um, um, I think the, the biggest, the, the wild card is, uh, and aside from, you know, international uncertainty in terms of uh, what the trade, uh, how the global trading system will look like uh, three years or five years down the road, uh, cyber is always a big one. That's the one that, you know, you could wake up one day and, um, you know, data, data protection. And that's, uh, that's one you have, we always have to take quite seriously. And that's one that, uh, that continues to, I think, to, to, uh, to uh, get a lot of time and attention, rightfully so, from uh, from senior management in uh, different organizations. Very good. Well, I think we've run out of time. Thank you very much, Louis. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very much.